once it says that it has started. I will begin. There we go. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. We have Commander James Flint here. He is um, an associate professor of surgery for orthopedics and orthopedic oncology uh, oncologist. Um, I'll let him um, introduce himself as well, but he is stationed at uh, Naval Medical Center San Diego and um, is here today to talk about vitamin D deficiency in the military. Thank you so much, Commander Flint. Thanks, Commander. Appreciate it. Um, so, so exactly, exactly that. So James Flint, I'm a commander um, uh, at Naval Medical Center San Diego, orthopedic oncologist. Um, just briefly about me, um, joined the military, enlisted in 1998. So all the things I'm about to talk to, uh, to you about, about recruits and whatnot, I've been there. Uh, I've also personally had stress fractures and had vitamin D deficiency. So this is all very personal. Uh, to me, uh, but also very practical. So I'd like to speak to you today about vitamin D deficiency and, and its impact on stress fractures and really ultimately its impact on readiness uh, for the military across services. Uh, so without further ado, we'll get into this. I want this to be really, um, I don't want to bore you with details. So a lot of this I could go on and on and on, uh, but I'm going to hit the main points, try to keep this somewhat brief so that we have a lot of to talk uh, at the end of this potentially, or a lot of time rather, to, to answer questions uh, and simulate some discussion. So what's the bottom line of this? The bottom line is that what we're really getting at is stress fractures. Stress fractures are common, they're costly, and they're a detriment to readiness. And vitamin D plays a very important role in that, uh, and it's an important modifiable risk factor for stress fractures. So the real question to ask is how can addressing vitamin D deficiency enable a medically ready force and a ready medical force, which should be terms that uh, are very familiar to us at this point. And I propose that it's time to act. I propose that it's been time to act. Um, so we'll go through what that looks like. Stress fractures getting started here are common. Anybody uh, who treats stress fractures, who treats recruits, uh, and certainly among the medical corps, we understand that they're extremely common. This table 10-1 uh, here is from an old study back in 1993 that showed even, even then stress fracture was top five among men and women in training programs. It remains a top, uh, top five most common injury in the military. Upwards of 5% of the military recruit population experiences stress fracture. And that's just looking at recruits. Even after recruit training, we see a lot of stress fractures. And it's known that up to 10% will develop another stress fracture. So it's a very common and recurrent injury. Uh, and there's about a four times greater occurrence among females, uh, female recruits. This is an extra study I pulled uh, from Air Force basic trainees, not specific to vitamin D, but specific to femoral neck stress fractures, which is a subset of stress fractures um, at a specific location. But they also showed in their study that four to 5% of military trainees experience a stress fracture. And the prevalence of femoral neck stress fracture uh, was disproportionate for females. Um, and according to the data that uh, was presented in this study, three times greater convalescent period compared to other stress fractures. So looking specifically at femoral neck, and they estimated the cost was $100,000 per case without even accounting for the surgical expense. Uh, so consistent throughout the literature, uh, an again, another example of women experiencing two to three times higher stress fracture than men. So very common injury. And it's very costly. So here's some cost comparisons. You know, when we look at cost comparisons, it's very difficult to pull accurate numbers. So these are pulled from various sources, various um, studies that have been done previously. These are pulled from Medicare data. These are pulled from TRICARE data, um, various sources to determine, you know, averages for cost of surgery and cost of non-operative care. Uh, and they really represent a gross underestimate of what we're actually seeing. This is also older data. Um, uh, from studies that were um, several years ago, if not greater than that. Uh, and the volume is just uh, way less than what we actually see. For example, the incidents that's reported here for surgical hip fractures and tibial stress fractures, uh, based on some creative math and prior publications, you would anticipate that the rate of stress fracture that is treated operatively would be about four recruits per year for hip and four for tibia. Uh, Truthfully, we're seeing, at least at this hospital, two to four per month. Um, so a gross underestimate of the actual volume. But let's just take that for, for an example, since we have it. 
the cost of a surgery to close, reduce, and pin, uh, which is one of the simplest procedures that we do for this, is about $8,000. And multiply that by about four recruits, we get $34,000. Similar for an uh, intramedullary nail of the tibia or the rod down the tibia, uh, that costs about $35,000. And that's just the operative cost. That's not the rehab associated with it, which is more akin to this number, about $1,700 to $1,900 for the rehab cost. And when you multiply that by the number of recruits that we have, again, these are just Marine Corps numbers. Uh, we're looking at about $6 million a year in just rehab costs for Marines. So the estimated direct cost in the Marine Corps is about $6 $6.5 million a year for treating stress fractures. And we extrapolate that to the DOD and multiple studies uh, also show this. We're looking at about $100 million or more dollars spent treating for stress fractures, a preventable injury annually in the military but that's just direct direct costs we're talking about we actually have a stress fracture and now we're treating it um the direct cost to the hospital system or to the mhs what about the indirect costs the things that we don't necessarily think about well when those recruits are not training and doing what they're supposed to be doing or getting to their uh, ultimate command they're in a limited duty status and they're being treated for that stress fracture uh, non-operative care can be on the order of three months uh, when you're talking about uh, operative length, we're talking about sitting in a rehab platoon for six months or more, oftentimes, uh, and getting pay and not doing what they're intended to be doing. Uh, there's unrecruit costs from discharging recruits, so those who don't make it. Um, you know, there's a cost associated with going through training, and when they don't train, um, you know, there's a financial cost to that. And then there's disability payments. So. Some of these uh, young folks get out and they get disability payments uh, because of their injury. Um, so several reports looking through the literature again, $100 million annually easily, uh, if not probably more than that. So they're common, they're costly, uh, and they inhibit readiness. So we look at several studies here. Uh, Reese et al. did a study looking at the attrition of military recruits. Uh, showed that stress fracture was the number one most powerful predictor of military discharge. Number one, four times higher risk than those who didn't have a stress fracture. Uh, there was an Army study out of 2016 showed that 60% of trainees developed a stress fracture a trite from the military. So they didn't even start their career. Uh, they didn't even get uh, through training. Limited duty and training delays. Again, further studies. You'll notice that a lot of these studies are out of military medicine. Um, I, I would encourage you to take a look at the dates of these. 2007, 2001. Uh, this this data has been reported for a long time now. Uh, but limited duty training delays, average of 62 delays, uh, 62 days of delay for uh, rehab platoon and recruits with a stress fracture. Those are uh, treated non-operatively. And those who had a femur or tibia stress fracture, another study showing nearly five months of training delay uh, due to treatment of stress fracture. Uh, and again, as I mentioned before, here's the article from Sports Medicine showing a 10% risk of developing another stress fracture. Uh, this is just one example of the surgery that we do when we talk about closed reduction percutaneous pinning. That's what uh, this picture represents here. So what about vitamin D? Uh, that's, you know, stress fracture is one thing. How does vitamin D play into this? Well, vitamin D, as many of us already know, it plays a critical role in bone health uh, as well as immune function. And there's lots of other um, functions that we don't even know about or just really haven't fleshed out. Uh, there's tons of data to support vitamin D and its effect in even the COVID pandemic, uh, in the cancer population, which is uh, also near and dear to my heart. Um, so it plays a, a very critical role and we know that it influences bone health. Looking at the numbers, just what does vitamin D deficiency and sufficiency look like? Um, most would agree uh, that insufficiency is defined as less than 30 nanograms per milliliter. There's different ways that we measure it. Uh, and deficiency is less than 20. And that's certainly how I uh, define it in my practice. The optimal levels for sufficiency really are not defined. Uh, right now, we use anything greater than 30 as sufficient. But in my opinion, I think greater than 40 is probably a more reasonable estimate of what's sufficient uh, because it's not only a bone health issue, it's uh, a performance issue. Uh, and there's some studies that show that performance is actually greater if your numbers are greater than 40. We talk about toxic levels. Toxic levels don't really occur. Uh, it's very rare, and we don't think about that until upwards of 100 to 150 nanograms per milliliter. 
Uh, and again, it's one of the most mod uh, important modifiable risk factors for the development of stress fractures. Here's several studies uh, more. Um, 2006 study out of the Journal of Bone and Mineral Research showed that the most significant risk factor for stress fractures, this was in recruits uh, in Finland, was a below median vitamin D level. So below 30 is how they defined it uh, as well. Uh, AJSM, a sports medicine journal, looked at um, levels with significantly lower vitamin D levels in the military personnel with stress fractures compared to their controls. So again, linking vitamin D and stress fractures. Uh, Berge and Bone Mineral uh, Research 2011 showed a dose response relationship between vitamin D and stress fractures. And I bring all this up to say, well, maybe it's just because vitamin D is so common. And that's why, you know, it's really not an association. No, there's multiple studies that show this uh, way more than what I'm even presenting here. So there's a clear link between vitamin D and stress fractures. Uh, a randomized control trial by LAPI was uh, well known among the military population. It was a randomized control trial with an intention to treat uh, with calcium and vitamin D supplementation. And these were really the lowest levels of calcium and vitamin D supplementation. In female Navy recruits, they looked at 5,000 recruits and the increase, uh, excuse me, the incidence of stress fracture decreased by 20% in those who were supplemented. So why does all this matter? Uh, well, the vision, mission, and strategic roadmap, things that we you know, look at from a medical core standpoint and certainly the DHA standpoint as we're being integrated is, you know, what are our goals? What are we trying to achieve here? Well, the quadruple aim uh, as defined, I pulled this right off the website, increased readiness, better health, better care, lower cost. So how does vitamin D and prevention of stress fractures play into that? Let's take a closer look. Increased readiness plays directly into uh, the role here as far as patients go, right? If we can prevent stress fractures and we uh, are preventing harm and preventing them from breaking and preventing them from attriting, we're providing better health, they're in better health, uh, and we're providing better care. To the combatant commands, I really wanted to focus on this because it's not just us doing something better for recruits and, and making a lab value look better and maybe preventing you know, a stress fracture, it really has a direct effect on the combatant commands. This is a real solution to joint mission success and joint mission readiness. So one of my focuses and really everything I do is readiness. So operational surgical readiness uh, is one thing that I focus on as a surgeon, but this ties into medical readiness for every military member across services, regardless Navy, Medi uh, Navy Marine Corps, Army, Air Force, Space Force, it, it applies to all of us. Um, so we're going to improve readiness, health, and experience of, of medical care uh, by addressing this issue. Now let's look at the DHA campaign plan going forward. This is kind of hot off the press. Uh, our main goals here are great outcomes, a ready medical force, satisfied patients, and fulfilled staff. And I'll talk about these uh, a little bit more as we go forward. But you know, our number one goal going forward is medically ready force. It's our number one outcome. Let's look at the Surgeon General's uh, Surgeon General's priorities, right, is people. Our military and civilian workforce are our greatest strength, so we should be taking care of our people. Uh, and we need to get them on platforms. We can't get them to platforms if they're attriting or if they never make it to begin with, or if they're on those platforms are getting delayed or they miss the ship uh, because they're in a rehab uh, facility because of a stress fracture that could have been prevented. So these are clearly priorities for DHA, for Surgeon General, for us as a medical corps. Um, and then I would just say, you know, how do we define a great, great outcome? This is an example of two patients. Um, this could be any given week here at Naval Medical Center San Diego or wherever you are. I'm sure many of you can relate to this. The picture on the left is a femoral neck stress fracture that was completed. We would typically, you know, expect to see this in osteoporotic elderly person, uh, but this is a 19 or 18 year old uh, who was in recruit training. Um, completed a stress fracture, he had low vitamin D, significantly low, and not only did it have a stress fracture completed on, the, on this side, he had it incomplete on the other side, so he ended up getting surgery on both sides. Um, is that a great outcome? There's another less than 20 year old completed stress fracture of the tibia. He was vitamin D deficient. Uh, clearly ignored the pain that he was having, and he ended up getting surgery for this. You know, is that a is that a 
great outcome. Are these service members medically ready? Will they ever be medically ready at this point? Uh, will they attract from training? And could this, have been, could this have been prevented? I would argue that it can. So what are the recommendations? You know, all that to say, I'm not gonna say paint a picture that's bleak without offering some recommendations. So what I propose is awareness, prevention, and early treatment. So practical recommendations to improve the health and readiness of our forces, decrease monetary and personnel costs. So last December, we published in a commentary in military medicine that talked about this issue and what I'm briefing today, specifically looking at uh, vitamin D's role in preventing stress fractures, pre pre presented all the data that we've had for decades now, uh, and some work has been done, um, and, but more needs to be done. Um, so we published this with the intent of showing uh, the data that's there uh, and hopefully proposing that it's time to act. Uh, so there's some practical recommendations here as far as what we can do to achieve this. Uh, I'm gonna go through them right now. Recommendations include sun and diet. Vitamin D is the sunshine vitamin. Uh, there is a clear role we usually get our vitamin D through the sun. However, operational and training environments may prohibit that. A lot of times we're out in the sun in operational settings, particularly Marines, for example, uh, they're not really getting the sun that they need because they're covering up with long sleeve shirts, hats, glasses, uh, sunscreen. So even though they're out in the sun a lot, doesn't mean they're getting the proper vitamin D that they need. Uh, also, uh, diet. Diet is just an adjunct. It's, we really don't get enough in our diet of vitamin D to have sufficient levels. Most of the dietary sources of that either come through fatty fish or through dietary supplements or fortified uh, products that uh, Marines and, and recruits in general just aren't really thrilled about eating uh, and consuming. Uh, another thing about sun is, you know, uh, aside from the southern states, anyone above the about the 35th latitude uh, is really not getting adequate sun exposure anyway and certainly during the summer uh, during the winter months that's a problem as well so sun sun is problematic uh, in and of itself so these are only adjuncts not solutions routine supplementation is great uh, i would encourage it i would promote it throughout the uh, department of defense through the dha um, but it's also an adjunct uh, there's lots of problems with supplementation. Uh, forcing supplementation doesn't really work. A lot of people aren't going to take those supplements and it's not inexpensive to just give everyone pills. Uh, and that's one of the most common things I've heard is that I, I can give them pills, but they're not going to take them. Uh, and that's fine. We don't need to force people to take them, but supplementation does work and it should still be encouraged uh, throughout the Department of Defense. Uh, it's being done by the Army. They had a performance readiness bar. I don't know if that's still being given. I'm assuming it is. It has uh, supplemental calcium and vitamin D, so it's a step in the right direction. So the practical recommendations uh, for uh, action include early screening and treatment. So this is really what I propose is, is recognizing that the military is high risk. We've known this for, for decades now, um, that we're at high risk of stress fractures and impediment to readiness. Uh, and a screen and treat program could be implemented as soon as we arrive to recruit training. We could identify this problem uh, and treat it. We could also identify this issue as early as military entrance facilities at MEP stations, uh, identifying where the problem is before they even start and come into the military. Uh, and again, just to go back to the supplementation piece, this isn't a supplementation that I'm recommending um, primarily, it's a treatment. So vitamin D deficiency is a known medical condition that warrants medical treatment per standard of care. So we're not talking about just throwing pills at people. We're talking about treating a medical condition that is known to cause uh, or be linked to stress fractures. Uh, and establish your standardized treatment protocol. So right now there's di various different protocols that can be used. There's uh, various data out there to support um, various different protocols for us in the military. We have 50,000 international units of ergo calciferol on formulary. It's what I recommend. It's what I use in my own practice um, and having a standardized regimen uh, among the military pharmacies would be helpful. Um, I would typically give that for three months and then I'll recheck the levels. If they're still low, I continue. If they're not, I just recommend going to routine supplementation. So let's look at a cost comparison back to the money side of things. A screen and treat program if implemented, would cost $4 for a lab test. There'd be no additional 
um, blood draw that was needed because we already draw blood. All of our recruits get blood drawn uh, upon entry to recruit training. Uh, if we were to do this at MEPS, they already get blood drawn. So there's really no additional harm to testing for it. It costs $4 to do, to do so. And if they're found deficient, uh, three month treatment of vitamin D 50,000 international units is $4. So it's really $8 to prevent a potential fracture. And I say potential because uh, while there is a link and there's three to four times higher rate of stress fractures with vitamin D deficiency, not everyone who's vitamin D deficient is going to go on to stress fracture. We recognize that. Um, however, screen and treat program, there's no lost time. There's decreased or no attrition uh, because we're going to be treating that uh, the medical condition ahead of time. They'll have better um, baseline vitamin D levels will be hopefully normal or sufficient. We'll have to see a less stress fracture rate and improved health. The alternative is the wait and break protocol, which is essentially what we're doing now and have been doing for decades, um, which is, is waiting until the uh, recruits respond or have bone pain or have uh, symptoms while they're in training. Uh, we don't routinely screen for vitamin D, so we never look at that. Uh, we wait for them to have symptoms. We treat it once we see the symptoms uh, or get the objective data, which is an X-ray or an MRI. Uh, and then if they go under non-operative treatment, it's anywhere close to about $2,000 uh, per stress fracture just for the rehab side of things uh, and operative treatment well in excess of 8,000 per stress fracture. So uh, you can see a much, much more um, significant cost there. And then not only that, but the personnel costs, the readiness uh, and the failure to address the preventable condition, which I'll go back to. Um, and then just looking at, you know, if we looked at all trainees, say we tested everybody, and I'll show some more data here in a minute, um, we would still be less expensive from a cost standpoint to just screen and treat everybody than to wait for them to break and treat them operatively uh, or even non-operatively. So here's an example of a cost breakdown from, from our own command, a brief that I recently gave. So NM, NMCSD in San Diego here is tied to MCRD, uh, Marine Corps Recruit Training District in San Diego. Um, so if we were to implement this program, assuming 21,000 recruits per year at MCRD, screening lab costs $4. We're already doing the lab, so we'll just add it to the battery of labs that are already done. It's going to cost about $86,000 $86, a year to do that. Uh, if we assume that half of the people are going to be deficient, half our recruits are deficient, I, I would argue it's probably going to be more than that. Uh, but let's just say it's half. We're looking at about $41,000. And then from a surgical standpoint, whether it's a hip surgery or a tibia, just on the conservative side, uh, at our current rate, which is about 24 per year, is what we'd see uh, estimate here, we're looking at about $200,000. So when we look at the estimated annual direct costs, which would include the operative and non-operative costs, it's really at about 364,000-ish. Again, it's hard to estimate these numbers. Uh, whereas a screen and treat program would have cost 127. So we're looking at a 65% cost savings if we would just screen and treat and prevent that injury from even happening. But more importantly, aside from just the monetary value, which is important uh, and is quantifiable, uh, more importantly, the screen and treat results will hopefully uh, ideally result in no loss of training time because we don't need to slow down their training. If we identify that they have vitamin D deficiency, we just let them keep training uh, unless they're symptomatic. No loss training time, decreased or no attrition, because we're addressing the underlying condition, which is going to result in improved health, which is going to result in a medically ready force, which is going to result in greater outcomes and satisfied patients, satisfied staff because we're doing good and we're preventing harm. As opposed to wait and break, again, we're failing to address a known preventable condition, a condition that we've had an association and known the association for decades. We're going to see attrition of previously healthy patients who now never have a chance to serve. Uh, I've seen this over the eight years of my practice. Um, so many Marines, uh, innumerable of that, will never uh, serve because they've just attracted from military service because of stress fractures. Uh, worse outcomes, unfit force for those who sustain the stress fractures, <laughs> and infection, and unfulfilled staff. So what do we recommend? I recommend that, that a ready medical force should act. I recommend implementing a strong bones campaign. Um, medically ready force needs strong bones. Uh, the idea would be to increase awareness of bone health issues, educate our high-risk population, educate our medical force, and target recruit and 
recruits and prospects. You know, not only recruit training commands, but targeting MEPS as well, which would be a prevention and readiness program. There are other programs that have um, done similar. The American Orthopedic Association Own the Bone program is a well-known program uh, on the civilian side of things that is really focused on osteoporotic care, um, but owning the bone health component of things uh, has been very successful in that. Uh, AAOS, which is the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, uh, I like to throw this in here because it was a military campaign uh, during the war. Even heroes have heroes. So these campaigns can be very effective uh, and reach uh, many. So what are the action items? The action items uh, at various levels, at the provider level, first of all, so um, IDCs, PAs, um, nurse practitioners, uh, physicians, you know, these are some practical practical things that we can do and promote lifestyle modification. So diet and exercise. These are the hallmarks of just healthy living, um, healthy sun exposure as well. Uh, I recommend if I'm going to recommend sun exposure, it's going to be 20 minutes in the midday hour in the midday sun. Um, but again, because of operational demands, it's it's really impractical to say that you're just going to go lay out for 20 minutes and get your, your sun. But we should encourage lifestyle modifications that are healthy. Uh, supplementation. I would encourage and promote supplementation, vitamin D and calcium uh, on a daily basis. Uh, supplementation could be anything. The the female study of Navy recruits used eight uh, 800 international units of vitamin D with 2,000 of calcium. You know, personally, I take 5,000 un international units a day. There's no, no magic number, um, but the upper limit, uh, it, really 10,000 a day for over uh, an extended period of time might lead to toxicity, it might not. So really, you can do anything, just supplement. Um, uh, it doesn't have to be mandated, just encourage it. Testing, screen and treat. If you think that somebody has a problem, if they're coming in with a March fracture, they're coming in with pain in their feet, they're coming in with pain in their tibia, you think, well, maybe this could be stress fracture, maybe it could be shin splints, uh, maybe it could be lots of things. If they come in with musculoskeletal complaints, hip, knee, uh, tibia, foot, test it, screen for vitamin D deficiency, see if there's a problem there. Uh, I would say for the patients that I treat that actually have stress fracture or suspected stress fracture, I would easily say the number is greater than 90% of the time that I'm identifying a vitamin D deficiency. So if we can identify that, screen for it, we can treat it early and we can prevent these problems from happening. Treatment, I mentioned the standardized regimen. Uh, again, I use 50,000 international units. It's on formulary here. It's very easy. You do that for three months. You see them back in three months, repeat the lab. And appropriate follow-up is a really important piece of that, um, especially when we're talking about tr treatment during recruit training. Uh, so some of these recruit trainings will be over by the time that that course is done. So they need follow-up care. They need to reach out to that next clinic, that next primary care, so they can get into that clinic, get their levels checked, and make sure that we have appropriate follow-up for them. Provider awareness, strong bones campaign. Again, this is something that um, trying to get started now is, is a formal campaign for provider awareness, which is one piece of that, leadership education and action, uh, but also patient awareness. Uh, and there's a patient-centered focus to the campaign as well. So what does that look like? It looks like posters and it looks like ads in dining halls and clinics in hallways. It looks like a marketing campaign public awareness on social media. Social media is is um, a strong outlet for, for this type of campaign uh, and would be highly effective. A speaker series uh, by bone health experts. I'm not the only expert on this. Um, and this has been, again, published for many, many years by many, many people uh, who are very passionate about this. So I encourage, and all of you that are on the, uh, on the call today are clearly interested in this topic. So. You're the experts. We need to target junior enlisted in the training programs. We also need to target uh, professionals. So our IDCs, our nurse practitioners, PAs, family med, sports med, there's really no end to who we should be educating for this, uh, but also our, our executive leaders, right? Our COs, uh, executive leaders at uh, DHA and recruit training. I've, I've talked to several um, commanding generals uh, already about this who are also extremely interested in this topic and preventing injury. Uh, today is obviously we're talking to the medical corps, um, so this is one step in that. And then a professional series to look at recognition, evaluation, standardized treatment, which is exactly what we're doing today. Um, we also need to advocate for implementation. Um, so at the DOD level, um, across services, 
Uh, I would also advocate for implementation as early as MEPS. I know there's some challenges to that, and a lot of discussion would certainly have to be uh, fleshed out, um, but at least talking about it would be a good first step. And then research support. So ongoing studies. I've got a prospective study I'm trying to start now for uh, vitamin D screen and treat program for uh, military recruit training, um, but that costs money, so we need research support. What does a campaign look like? This is just something I threw together. This is unofficial. It's merely my attempt to throw together what a poster or something could look like. Uh, these are not uh, officially approved anything, so you know, don't quote me on any of this. But um, as far as the pictures go, I did put websites on there, so you know I'm not just stealing stuff. Uh, but strong sailors need strong bones. This could be service specific um, taglines, right? Strong sailors need strong bones. Strong Marines need strong bones. Strong airmen need strong bones. Uh, strong, um, you know, whatever you want to use. Strong soldiers need strong bones, right? This is across services. We need a, a very simple slogan to put up on walls to catch people's eyes and say, hey, what, what is that about? I want strong bones. I want to be strong. Uh, and we need to get the message out that bone health is bone, bone health is important. Vitamin D and stress fracture uh, are important topics. So what's the big deal? Simple taglines. Deficiency of vitamin D. It's a strong predictor of fracture. It's a serious injury. What can you do? Talk to your doc. Improve your fitness and your diet. Don't ignore that pain that you've been ignoring during recruit training. Don't just suck it up. Sometimes you need to suck it up, but sometimes it's bone pain and you're going to break um, and you need to get checked out. Get that vitamin D level checked. Consider a supplement. Okay. Here's another example. Strong Marines need strong bones. Uh, very simple things. If you know somebody, uh, since we have a lot of people on this call, if you know somebody who's great at posters and marketing uh, through the military side of things, that would be great. Please let me know. I'm looking for that. Uh, looking to get some official uh, publications up soon so that I can spread that out and spread the word. Action items at the top level would include uh, implementation of recruit commands. So across the, D, uh, the DOD. So that would look like screening labs upon entry into recruit training. And again, we'd only be treating those who are insufficient. So this isn't even a supplementation. I don't even recommend at this level saying, let's give everyone pills. I'm just saying, let's let's recognize that it's a common problem. Let's identify it and let's treat it per the standard of care. Uh, it's a weekly pill. Uh, there are some uh, obvious challenges to, to implementing that kind of program. But when you have a recognized medical condition that warrants medical care, we're really kind of obligated to treat that. Uh, training can continue. So if they're asymptomatic, even with vitamin D deficiency, they can still train. So we'll actually increase our um, ability to graduate recruits and get them on to the combatant commands that they need to be at. And then recruits can follow up with their PCM. So there's a follow up protocol that needs to be uh, discovered and, and managed there. I've been talking with various clinics to see what that would look like. And uh, I've had very receptive uh, feedback. So we're starting to see that implemented already at the grassroots level with with providers that are very interested in this topic and then MEPS, um, you know we could easily add vitamin d to the battery to test that is already uh, looked at at meps they already get blood so we could add that to it it would be very um, cheap to do so um, i know there's some challenges here with what that would look like especially in a um, time and an environment where recruiting is difficult right now our numbers are pretty low I certainly wouldn't want to uh, you know, contribute to that, uh, but we could recognize the problem and we could encourage people to get treated before they even hit recruit training command. So I think MEPS is an important part of this. Um, get them before they even come into the military. And then you know, this could be part of uh, a greater national uh, health initiative to educate people uh, in the delayed entry program and really nationally about bone health. Uh, will it work? Well. This is just one study that came across. There's other studies, but um, this is in 2012. So a decade ago, the Army published a study about a multiple intervention strategy for reducing femoral neck stress fractures. What did they do? Their injury prevention strategy was leadership education, number one, leadership enforcement after they were educated, which was really physical therapy and a graduated training uh, strengthening program. 
Uh, and then injury surveillance and reporting. So when they had femoral neck stress fractures or when they're having symptoms of stress fractures, they were reported, they were pulled out of training, they were appropriately rehabbed, and they were reintegrated. Uh, and so what was the result of that? Well, for men, femoral neck stress uh, incidents were reduced, uh, injuries were reduced from 13, 13 to 20 to 8. Uh, for women, from 35 to 41 to 18. Um, and then removal from training is reduced. So a lot of these people are just continued on in training. Um, so it's been done before. This is even a, kind of a more simpler approach. Uh, so what do I, uh, what I propose is very similar to this, but even more so. And we put in that medical component of we actually have an injury that we're treating. Let's treat that. Let's educate. Let's have a campaign. Let's do even more than we did back then, which already showed that it was beneficial. So what's the current status of uh, where we're at today? Uh, I've, uh, like I said before, I commented, uh, excuse me, published a commentary in military medicine back in December of 2021. I would encourage you to read that if you haven't already. Please feel free to distribute that widely. Uh, that was in military <laughs> medicine. Um, I briefed the neuromusculoskeletal committees, uh, me and my team. We've, we've talked to the sports and human performance subcommittees. We've got uh, raving support uh, from them. I'm briefing another subcommittee, hopefully here in the, in the near future. I've also briefed the Operational Quality and Safety Council uh, at the PUMED level and, and have had positive and strong feedback uh, at all levels and hope to bridge that gap from PUMED now to DHA and start making DHA briefings as well. I've also briefed individual clinics and individual providers um, and start uh, and starting to implement local command implementation as well. And then, of course, today is a medical course symposium trying to get the word out to uh, my colleagues. Next steps include briefing again at the DHA level to bring this not only just within the Navy and Marine Corps, but really as a widespread problem that we know it is, identify it and start implementing it across the services. Um, and then local implementation, we're starting to do that here uh, at Naval Medical Center San Diego as we start to develop some marketing uh, material. Um, certainly welcome any help on that. Uh, and then wider implementation. The goal of, again, to do DHA wide implementation or at least awareness um, and then talking about it at the MEPS level and really at a national health initiative level. So I'm going to stop right there. I'll take any questions. I took uh, my email addresses here for you. I really welcome any support. Uh, can't do this alone. Haven't done it alone. It takes uh, many, many interested parties, and many, many moving parts to uh, make this happen, something like this. I appreciate all the support that I've had already. Uh, it's been immense. It's been incredibly helpful. Uh, I'm eternally grateful and I look forward to um, improving uh, our operational readiness through this campaign. With that, I'll stop. Thank you so much, Commander Flynn. Thank you. Um, we did have one question in the chat. I don't know if uh, that person wants to read their question themselves. You can unmute yourself. If not, I'm happy to read it. That's fine. Um, it's that uh, the question was that they heard you say that vitamin D has performance benefits as well as benefits to bone health. And if you could speak to any of those performance benefits as well. Yeah. So performance benefits, there's a couple studies out. Um, I can't, I didn't draw it for this uh, brief in particular, but um, they showed actual um, performance, physical performance uh, increased not only with improvement of vitamin D, but specifically above 40. If you email me, I'll try to find Adrian Marino. I'll try to track you down. I'll send you the article that I was referring to there. Uh, specifically uh, that looked at human performance. That's another piece of this. Um, I'm specifically looking at it, obviously, from the fracture standpoint, but I believe there's more to be said from a human performance standpoint, uh, and I'm happy to send that article along. I'll make a note of it. Thank you. Any other questions? Please feel free to either just unmute yourself and start talking. You can also raise your hand if you are in Teams. Um, if you are trying to speak and um, you're having trouble on the phone, um, you can also put it in the chat uh, as well. Um, the other thing is I did mute 
some people who were not muted initially, so I don't know if you had called in and uh, my muting you may have messed that up. I apologize if I did. Um, you might be able to hit star six and that might unmute you. You can try. Again, my email is in there, so I just want yeah, if anyone doesn't have a microphone, please feel free to type it in the chat as well. We do have some time. Um, I thought that was a great presentation, uh, Commander Flynn. Thank you for, for giving it. Um, I guess my question is, how come we don't, I mean, we, we have a lot of things in maps. Um, why, why can't we initiate uh, just standardized testing for vitamin D. I mean, I feel like we test for titers and other things um, in maps uh, before they before recruits even come in. Why can't that be a like you have to have your vitamin D level over a certain amount before you even get um, approval to be accepted into the military? Uh, I completely agree. Which is why I bring it up. It's not something that we routinely do. It's not part of the routine battery of labs that we take or have been taking. I think it could easily be implemented uh, and that's why I say it doesn't even it doesn't add anything more uh, from an injury standpoint. There's, it's not an additional blood draw where you just add it to what we're already doing uh, and I completely agree with you. I, th I think the argument to be made there is if we're testing it at MEPS and say it's really a matter of is this a <laughs> disqualifying condition or not. Uh, I, I don't think we could go that far. I think that would be uh, probably a mistake to do that uh, because while there is an association with stress fractures, not everyone's going to get a stress fracture. And while we're already seeing a decrease in the amount of recruiting, we certainly don't want to make that any worse by disqualifying people who who may do just fine. We don't, we, we don't know. Uh, but I think we should certainly look for that. It's something that we could easily discover. Um, and we know that there's links to, um, when we talk about human performance, a lot of this is due to sedentary lifetime, lifestyle before they get into recruit training, um, inadequate sun, inadequate diet, those kind of things. And I think we should be at least educating people about that before they come into the military so that we have the you know the very best readiness uh, and health of our forces kind of from the outset completely agree sounds good yeah um I, I agree maybe not disqualifying them but that way we have the number so as soon as they start training we can just give them that treatment yeah. uh, we do have a few like questions that. yeah we have some questions in the chat so one of them is um, are there other signs and symptoms related to vitamin D deficiency besides the labs? Um, and I assume besides a fracture, like uh, any other clinical presentations? Yeah, from an orthopedic standpoint, the you know the most common presentation to the orthopedic clinic is pain, and it's usually hip pain or tibia tibia pain uh, because they're having stress fractures. So it's it's and it's difficult, right? So you have especially Marines. Marines are kind of known for pushing past the pain and for sucking it up. And so they often present late after they have a near complete or completed stress fracture, which presents as inability to bear weight, uh, pain. But all those all those conditions started with a little bit of pain, right? A little bit of pain that didn't go away. Um, so it's really identifying those uh, signs. It's pain with weight bearing, pain in the tibia, pain in the feet, uh, pain in the hips. Uh, those are the most common things that we're seeing. Uh, and unless we're checking that lab, it's it's not an association that we um, identify early because we're not routinely checking it. But like I said, every time I treat this a lot, uh, every time I check it, I would say easily over 90% of them are vitamin D deficient, just anecdotally. Excellent. Thank you. Um, there's a couple other questions and I'll just read them. Um, one is, how for for others who are skeptical about this uh, the support of this across the MHS, how can we convince them that this is something that we should do, um, even though it's not a standard screening by USPSTF? Um, unfortunately, that can be a challenge. So, do you have any recommendations for? I'm, I I don't know what USPSTF. Yeah, preventive task force. Um, yeah, no, I I agree. I I think. For others, how can we work to convince them through a strong bones campaign, <laughs> right? So I, I think through getting the word out, through educating, by talking to leaders, by by talking like this, right? You know, people are going to be on here, and then they'll carry kind of carry that water somewhere else and and carry the message on by getting out those posters, you know, or or, or social media campaigns and saying, hey, this is an important issue. We've known about it for a long time. Uh, we've done some things in the past, and that's great, but we need to do much more. 
Um, and from even from a, a population screening standpoint, right, it, it's hugely beneficial to the population as a whole, but certainly beneficial and necessary in a military population where we expect so much uh, and physically demanding um, needs of our military. So it, it's really just a necessity. So I think just continuing the discussions like this, starting a formal campaign where we can put those uh, social media marketing out, putting posters on walls, uh, the Own the Bone campaign has been very successful in doing that. Um, ask any orthopedic surgeon, they almost, uh, you know, inevitably will know, hey, that's Own the Bone. I know what that means. I know that I need to be taking care of the bones. Um, strong bones would be an easy thing, too. Hey, I, I want everyone to know about strong bones. Um, I need everyone to know that sailors need strong bones and Marines and airmen and soldiers need strong bones. And once we get that in their heads, uh, and it becomes a catchphrase, I think people will catch on, hey, I, hey, this is important. We should probably pay attention to that. Thank you. Um, another question was, if you could speak to the use of the, um, I think it's 50,000 international units versus a lower dose and where that where that dose came up from. Yeah, so various treatment regimens um, are, uh, th th there's various treatment regimens, <laughs> and I know everyone does very uh, different um, treatment protocols, and that's totally fine. In, in my commentary, in our commentary, we wanted to standardize the treatment of that. So personally, in my practice, I've always used 50,000 international units, um, and I do that weekly for three months. So that's what I recommend. It's on formulary. We don't need to reinvent the wheel on that. Um, there's a, uh, which article was it? I can't quote the authors right now, but uh, really, any regimen that gives 600,000 international units over about a three month period is going to be sufficient. So whether you do that with 50,000 international units a day or you want to do $25,000 or 25,000 international units biweekly, I do 50,000 international units weekly. It really doesn't matter so much. Uh, what matters is that you treat the underlying condition and we correct the problem. So um, I think it would be easier if we just standardize that, and that's why I use 50,000 once a week. It's easier for people to remember, you know, hey, well, I got every Monday I got to take this pill, or you know, it's it's not a daily thing. So uh, so that's why I use 50,000. Lower doses are effective. You know, the the minimum recommendation uh, is 600 inter international units. It's really only effective to maintain a level that you already have. It's not really um, correcting uh, anything. Uh, so that's why for, for me personally, I know people will do uh, a supplementation value or uh, level of about 1,000 to 2,000. I think that's a great um, supplementation value. For most patients, I say, hey, take a take 1,000 or two a day. That's a good supplement. Personally, I take 5,000. I've had a couple stress fractures and I've had low vitamin D. So, um, so that's what I do. Wonderful, thank you. Um, another question that was in the chat was, um, do you have a suggested method for capturing at-risk individuals who may have already completed boot camp? Uh, for example, is there a way to add them, add screening procedures for all training that involves uh, like regimented PT? Uh, I think that's a great question and a great idea. There's no, obviously nothing, this is all kind of getting started, but I, I like that idea. Uh, usually, after the recruits are leaving boot camp, they're going on to some kind of training command, right? So follow on training, whether A school or their service school or whatnot, that'd be an ideal location, not only to screen them at that level, uh, or uh, but to educate them, right? So that's where that strong bones campaign says, hey, let me get on, let me get on the series of, you know, I know your 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 training is in maybe it's hospital court school or maybe it's diesel mechanic school or whatever it is. It really doesn't matter you're gonna have some mandatory training on bone health. Um, and certainly if they're having any symptoms, they should be treated because the primary care should know that and they should screen that and treat it. Um, but uh, we'll probably miss some people because of that. Uh, but if we can get, get into their minds, you know, I need strong bones, when they start having symptoms, they'll be more inclined to actually go see their primary care and say, hey, I, I wanna get this checked out. That's great, thank you. Um, any other questions from the group? No. All right. Well, I mean, 
my big thing is like I feel like this this seems very obvious um and you know what's interesting is um as a pediatrician I see this and all I think is I need to start treating all my teenagers or checking all my teenagers for vitamin d levels to help prevent this in their adolescent and young uh early 20s for anyone that's going to become a recruit so um definitely something that is uh useful for I think all fields of medicine not just orthopedics not just you know family medicine or or internal medicine but even from as a pediatric provider, I, I still think of that as well. So um, thank you. I I know it's only um, uh, fifteen fifty here, uh, and we did say that we'll have an hour. So I don't know if you're okay staying on just a few extra minutes in case anyone else has any other questions. But I uh, I will kind of release everyone and thank you all for joining and participating. Uh, we're really grateful to have um, great speakers like Commander Flint for this uh, lecture series. So thank you for joining us. Um, I am going. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording now, just so everyone knows. Yeah, to your point, it's kind of a self-defense.